Hi, I thought I would start this video with a list of the components that make up my unique Hi-Fi system. My first caveat is that this is a two-channel system for vinyl and CDs. My second caveat is that in no single component have I invested more than a thousand dollars. I'll start with an overview. I don't have a dedicated room for my stereo, and my wife won't let me commandeer the living room, so I do the best I can. I have spread my system throughout the house. In the front rooms of the house, I have two adjoining closets. In closet number one, I have the turntable, an active crossover, the preamp, a CD player, and attached to the wall, a combination active crossover and amplifier. The interconnect wires run through the adjoining wall to closet number two, which contains two more amplifiers. From the three amplifiers, the speaker wires run under the house to the speakers in my living room. This setup helps with two problems. One, it isolates my turntable and CD player from low frequencies. And two, it isolates me from the noise of my vintage amplifiers, which have both transformer noise and fans to keep them cool. As I said, my system runs three amplifiers. Amplifier number one runs my full range speakers. Amplifier number two runs my mid bass speakers. And amplifier number three runs my subwoofer. The reason I call this my DIY system is many of the components have been significantly modified. Let's go through the system component by component. Let's start with the turntable. A Microseeky BL-51. The BL-51 was a respectable turntable in its time, circa 1978. It has sealed bearings, which give it a very long life. I've had two of these turntables. This one was in storage for years, until the other malfunctioned after 30 plus years of use. Just an FYI, I bought two different aftermarket turntable belts both listed for the Microseek EBL-51. One of the bells had significantly more wow and flutter than the other. I could see the difference visibly with a stroboscope disc and measure it with the RPM app. Buyer beware when buying aftermarket turntable bells. I have the Microseek copper mat. Since different metals resonate at different frequencies, the copper mat on top of the alloy platter cancels out platter resonance. To further reduce vibrations, the turntable sits on a three-quarter inch MDF base clad in Formica, and the four feet underneath are made of a isolation gel pad. The tone arm is a Dynavector DV501. It has a more complicated structure than a conventional tone arm. It is a bi-axis tone arm designed to be used with moving coil cartridges. On the horizontal axis, it is a high mass arm providing articulate base. And on the vertical axis, it is a low mass subarm providing great tracking. This arm is magnetically dampened on the horizontal axis. I use an Orisonic AV-101S anti-vibration head shell. My cartridge, the Denon DL-103R, is an excellent match for the Dynavector tone arm. This cartridge has been a long-standing favorite of mine. Though it was developed in 1962, this cartridge was a finalist in 2007 for Stereophile's Analog Component of the Year, and it is still in production today. Since it's a moving coil cartridge, it requires an additional gain stage before going into the phono stage of the preamp. I use the audio interface Step Up Transformer. This transformer was made by Dean Jensen back in the mid-1970s. We have impedance matched all components in this stereo system where possible, which brings me to the interconnect cables. I use Mogami pure patch cables throughout. I did try other esoteric and far more expensive cables and I couldn't tell the difference on this system. For my CD and SACD player, I use the Denon DVD 5910. 
It has five 24-bit DACs built by Burr Brown. In 2005, this was Denon's top-of-the-line audio video player. I was able to get this player for under $1,000 because it was discontinued and discounted when Blu-ray came out. It does not play Blu-ray. The preamplifier with phono stage is the Audio Research SP5. I changed one of the RCA inputs on the back to an output. This gave me three RCA outputs, one for each amplifier. On the preamp, I replaced all capacitors in the power supply with contemporary, closer tolerance components. And the most profound change was replacing the original op amp in the regulation stage of the power supply. This preamp uses the TI or National LM741 op amp semiconductor. I replaced it with the analog device AD711. This gave it much greater resolution and imaging. The first signal output from the preamplifier in closet number one is directly connected to the Audio Research D100 amplifier in closet number two. This signal to the Audio Research amplifier is at full frequency. On this amplifier, I replaced all the caps in the power supply. I also replaced the 12 1N4003 diodes in the regulation stage with ultra-fast hex threads. This swap was not easy as the hex threads are physically larger than the original diodes. It was challenging but well worth the effort. From the audio research amplifier, I run 40 feet of 8PR Kimber cable under the house to my main speakers. For speaker wire, I previously tried 12 gauge Romex and 12 gauge Monoprice. In my system, the Kimber cable was by far the best. A distant second was the Monoprice and lagging way behind was the Romex. I am now a fan of Kimber cable but I don't have any experience with any other equivalent priced speaker wires. On all my vintage speakers, I had all drivers and tweeters re-edged, reconed, and diaphragms replaced where needed. The main speakers are the Electro Voice Sentry 500 studio monitors. The EV Sentry 500s were pretty beat up when I got them. I stripped off a black vinyl surface wrap and got the boxes back to a bare MDF. I sanded and painted the sides red. For aesthetic reasons, I built grills for both the front and the back of the speakers. In the front of the speakers was a resistively loaded rotary switch. I removed the switch so the tweeters would always operate at 0 dB, which was preferable in my living room. On the back of the speakers, Behind the bi-amp access panel was a multi-pin plug-in socket, which depending on position lets you bi-amp the speaker or run the signal through its internal crossover. I removed this plug socket assembly and hardwired the signal directly to the speaker's internal passive crossover. I figured that the fewer items in the signal path, the better. On the EV Century 500 crossovers, I replaced the original capacitors and resistors with Mundorf Supreme Caps and Mundorf MOX resistors. The second signal output from the preamplifier goes to the Richter Scale audio control in closet number one, which I purchased solely for the crossover and I use none of the other functions on this device. The crossover uses the Linquence Riley alignment which provides a 24 dB per octave 90 Hz low pass signal to the JBL MPX300 amplifier in closet number two. Out of the JBL amplifier, I run 12 gauge speaker wire under the house to my Electro Voice mid bass speakers, the EVID 12.1s. In my stereo system, the mid bass speakers provide better dynamic range and a smoother transition between the EV Century 500s and the subwoofer. Originally, the mid-bass speakers contained an internal passive crossover, which I removed and then I directly hardwired the driver to the back of the speaker cabinet. Keep in mind, I am using the active crossover in the Richter Scale audio control. These speakers were very beat up when I got them. I painted them to be complementary to the EV Century 500s, which sit on top of them. 
This works out very well as it places my main speakers at ear level. I use furniture pads to isolate the speakers from each other and from the floor. The third signal output from my preamplifier goes to my Hafler Active Crossover and Amplifier in Closet Number 1. Hafler closed its operations in the United States. At a closeout sale, I was able to purchase the electronics section from a Hafler TRM-15S subwoofer. This gave me the active crossover and amplifier components needed for my subwoofer. Using two pieces of wood for the sides, I mounted the Hafler's electronics to the wall. I put metal screens on the top and the bottom to protect it and promote airflow. The Hafler's crossover, using the Linquence Riley alignment, operates up to 60 Hz at 12 dB per octave and has a filter that is set at 18 Hz to prevent the subwoofer from reproducing in audible frequencies. From the Hafler crossover and amplifier, I run 12 gauge speaker wire under the house to the subwoofer. I know the subwoofer is not optimally placed. Since this is our living room, I compromised with my wife. I could have the 15-inch subwoofer in the 5 cubic foot cabinet if I could make it disappear. I decided to design my subwoofer around the JBL 2235H loudspeaker. Using 1 inch thick MDF, I built my subwoofer cabinet to the JBL feel small alignment parameters. But I had to adapt the dimensions to the odd shape needed to place the subwoofer in the wall under the stairs. The subfloor under the stairs rests upon a U-shaped concrete footing that supports the center of the house. I was able to screw down my subwoofer cabinet to the subfloor, resting it right between two concrete supports. I fabricated a grill cloth, which makes the subwoofer appear to be an odd but not unpleasing wall design. Here is a summary of the signal path as it comes out of my SP5 preamplifier. Though I really love the sound of my system, all audiophiles know that no system is ever finished. I will post positive updates as I make them. Thank you for watching.